uh, it is now therefore time for a question period. The Leader of the Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Listen to these quotes. For my tax dollars, I want politicians who aren't frightened to disobey a provincial regime I believe is destructive to human beings. If, if trustees don't agree with the funding formula, I expect them to go out on a limb and push back, not implement it. Trustees acted like bureaucrats when what we desperately need are politicians who tell the province no. Mr. Speaker, those are the words of our current Liberal Premier wow. about the school closures wow. that now this How government is implementing. So my question, Mr. Speaker, is why has there been a complete 180 in the tone of the Premier? Well, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition has laid out exactly why I ran for provincial office, Mr. Speaker, because there was a government in office that wouldn't take our meetings that didn't listen to us, Mr. Speaker, that had cut funding across the province. The member from Renfrew come to order. And if this uh, continues, we'll move to warnings. I'm prepared. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, there were billions of dollars taken out of education in this province during the Harris years. That is why I ran for provincial office, Mr. Speaker. In fact, in fact, there are many members here who ran for provincial office because of the devastation that was wrought by that party when Harris was in office, Mr. Speaker. I'm proud to be here. We've rebuilt our education yes, system. 68% of kids were graduating. We came in You see it, please. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, I don't think the children and the families at the rally outside Queen's Park today here, here. would believe those words from the Premier. Right. And Mr. Speaker, another quote from the Premier is this. A key, from our current Premier, a key priority of the McGuinty government has been to keep good schools open. Immediately upon taking office, the government asked school boards to put a moratorium on school closures. Oh. This pause allowed the government to develop a new tool for boards to empower local decision-making on school closures. They wanted a moratorium then. Something's changed. That was Premier. That was our current Member Premier from the tropical north. advocating for a moratorium on school closures. But right now, when parents, when children are pleading for a moratorium, the government is deaf to those concerns. So, Mr. Speaker, why have they changed their mind on the moratorium? Question. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. When we came into office, Mr. Speaker, there had been, as I said, devastation across the education system in this province. It was absolutely necessary, Mr. Speaker, to put a moratorium in place while, gui while guidelines were put in place. Look, Mr. Speaker, I know how difficult it is and has been for decades for school boards to make decisions about school closures or potential consolidations. It's a most difficult decision that school boards have to make. But, Mr. Speaker, that moratorium was lifted, at least in part because school boards were saying, we can't run our boards unless we have the authority to make decisions that are in the best interest of kids. And that means the best programs, the best staffing, Mr. Speaker. And that means that as schools are built, as new Answer. modern buildings are created, there have to be sometimes school closures and consolidations. But in the final supplementary, Mr. Speaker, I'll talk about options. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, again to the Premier. Now, the Premier said there was devastation when she was running for office. Now, I have a stat here, Mr. Speaker. I think the government needs to hear this rather than heckle. According to the Legislative Library, this Liberal government has now closed 100 more schools wow. than the previous Conservative government ever dreamed of. They are setting records on school closures. The facts don't lie, Mr. Speaker. This Premier, this government, they said they were in it for education. This Premier was the Education Minister. It's actually coming from both sides, too.
Finish, Mr. Speaker, I guess the truth hurts, and, that, and that's why the government benches are heckling. But the reality is this Premier said she was in politics for education, Question. and she has now closed 100 more schools than any previous government ever dreamed of. This Premier is setting records on school closures. Okay. You see it, please? You see it, please? Premier. And we built. So, Mr. Speaker, um, I think what we also need to talk about is the 810 new oh, schools that have been built and the 780 new schools that have been built. So, there have been schools built in ridings across this province, Mr. Speaker, in rural, in northern, in suburban and urban communities. There has been a uh, a renovation of 780 schools, wow. Mr. Speaker, on top of the 810 schools. Wow. So, Mr. Speaker, I go back to what I said in the second question. I understand that closing a school or consolidating two schools is a real challenge for school boards. I also know, Mr. Speaker, that we have great examples in this province where school boards Remember have worked from together, Bruce Sound, where school from buildings have been kept open because there's been cooperation Answer. between school boards and municipalities. We need more of that. We've put money in place Member to help for that. Thank you. In case you didn't hear it, the member from Leeds Granville come to order. New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Tomorrow is a big day. The Liberals are allegedly tabling their first ballot budget in many years. But Mr. Speaker, I share the concerns of the Financial Accountability Officer and the Auditor General that the government's numbers don't add up. We've heard descriptions uh, in the media cooking the books. It's a shell game. It's smoke and mirrors. Regardless of what you I'm uh... The Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation will come to order. And I'm going to ask the member to withdraw because I don't want to get into this accusation before or after the budget about anything that's happening between uh, individuals and making an accusation. So I'd like you to withdraw. Uh, withdraw. You will be able to complete the question, please. Regardless of the term used, the evidence that the independent officers are highlighting speaks to the fact that government's numbers do not add up. And when things don't add up in Liberal Ontario, there's usually only one result, and that's big tax increases or severe budget cuts. And if the Premier could share with the Legislature today, which is it going to be? Given the independent officers say the numbers don't add up, is it going to be a tax Question. increase or a deep cut? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I know that the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition will be in the Legislature, will hear the budget speech tomorrow, and I would think, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker given his, uh, his conservative outlook on life, he would be pleased that the books in the province are being brought to balance. He would see that as a positive thing. But, Mr. Speaker, I will say that where we perhaps diverge is, from my perspective and from our perspective, a balanced budget means that we have the opportunity to build on the foundation that we have already put in place in this province. We've been building infrastructure. We've been building roads and schools and hospitals and bridges, Mr. Speaker, and transit. We've been investing in children's education and in the education of our post-secondary students, Mr. Speaker. We now, Mr. Speaker, with a balanced budget, have a responsibility to make yes, sure that we tackle the needs that people are confronting in this, uh, this globally uncertain economy, Mr. Speaker, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Seated, please. Be seated, please. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, if it actually was a balanced budget, then I would be pleased. But when the independent officers of Parliament are saying the numbers don't add up, that raises alarm bells across the province. Minister of Labour, come to order. We're inches away from warning people. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance has been claiming there will be a major booster shot for health care funding. But in January, the Financial Accountability Office reported that the government would need to slash its health care budget by $2.8 billion over the next years if it was to meet their balanced budget targets. And once again, 
And my question to the Premier is, who are we to believe, the Financial Accountability Officer or Chef Souza? Please enlighten the Legislature. The, uh, stop, stop. Order. Order. The member knows better. I uh, ask in this House that we either refer to people by their title or by their writing, and it won't happen again. Premier. We have a recipe for success, Mr. Speaker. I'm not amused. My responsibilities are to hold this place in decorum, and either any member making it happen in an opposite way is not liked by me. Bring it down. Please uh, take that uh, prop. I'm charged with uh, the decorum in this place. I'd appreciate help. Minister. No, just to keep it Mr. Speaker, the numbers do speak for themselves. We're increasing our revenues, we're growing our economy, we're exceeding Canada, the U.S., and the G7, and we're balancing the books tomorrow, Mr. Speaker. We're balancing the books next year, we're balancing the books the year after that, and we're investing in the people of Ontario. You see it, please? We're moving to warnings. If I'm not getting help, I'll give myself some help. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, the reality is no one believes this recipe the Minister of Finance is putting forward. No one believes this recipe. Let me share the words of the Financial Accountability Officer. I quote, the outlook for the budget balance has deteriorated and concluded Ontario's budget would be expected to re remain in deficit over the next five years. Will the Liberals come clean? You've got the Financial Accountability Officer saying one thing, you've got the Minister of Finance saying something entirely different. So to the Premier, who do you expect Ontarians to believe, the independent legislative oversight or the Minister of Finance? Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, independent Agencies around the world, here in Canada, the Conference Board of Canada has cited that Ontario's numbers is the most transparent with the greatest integrity of any other government in Canada. Every year, every year, the opposition and naysayers say Ontario can never come to balance, Ontario cannot do what they say they will do, and we exceed a target. Member from Nipissing is warned. Carry on. We've exceeded targets year over year, Mr. Speaker. We've been deliberate, we've been consistent, and we're balancing the budget. The budget. More importantly, the people who believe it are the people who have jobs this year, Mr. Speaker. Over 700,000 more jobs since the depths of the recession. It's families who have more to care for their families. Mr. Speaker, it's about them, and we're delivering Answer. for the people of Ontario. Yeah. You see it, please? You see it, please? New question? Member from Bramley Gormald. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> My question is to the Premier. Does this Premier believe in universal public pharmacare for Ontarians? Thank you. 
Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I appreciate the question, and the member opposite knows that for the past few years, our government has been relentless in advocating for a national pharmacare program here in Canada. Uh, quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, we have been the leading political voice in the country advocating for a national program that would ensure that all Canadians have that access to medicines, which is critically important. We know, Mr. Speaker, that at least one out of every ten families in this province and across the country are unable to secure the medicines that are prescribed to them because of financial difficulties. Uh, that's uh, the basis of our advocacy. It's an issue of fairness and health equity, the social determinants of health. It's no less important as, as the other aspects of Medicare, Mr. Speaker. That's why we have been working so hard with this advocacy. Yeah, thank you. Efforts, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier think that it's okay to sit by, for Ontario to sit by and wait for Ottawa to do something while the people in this province have to empty their wallet to pay for life saving medication day after day? Thank you. Minister? Well, Mr. Speaker, quite frankly, this member is late to the party. Exactly. We have been working across this country, Mr. Speaker, for the last three years in advocating for the exact access to medicines that the member opposite is uh, quite recently. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek is warned. The member from Ancaster is warned. Finish, please. And Mr. Speaker, despite being late to the party and despite recently having uh, found uh, the ability to articulate their advocacy for access to medicines, I applaud the third party for their advocacy. It's important that all of us who believe in issues of health equity and social determinants of health and the importance of access to prescribed medicine, it's important that we all work together. I just wish that the party, the third party, had been there three years ago yeah, or two you. years ago or even one year ago. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, all across Ontario, people are getting prescriptions that they can't afford to fill. People are reaching for their credit cards so their kids can get a much needed asthma inhaler. They're splitting their pills in half, or worse, going without medication. The NDP plan for universal pharmacare will save lives. But, but let's talk about being late to the party. Instead of doing anything, what has the Premier done? She sent her minister to Ottawa to talk, and last year, let's talk about advocacy. Last year, this government minister a budget is that slashed coverage of drug plans, that slashed coverage for seniors' drug care medication. That's their plan to slash coverage. Why does the government, why is this government so out of touch with what's going on in this province? Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm sorry, but I remember things last year a little differently because I remember that we added 170,000 more seniors in this province who at the time were paying a $100 deductible annually and were paying at least $6 as a co-payment each time they refilled a prescription. We brought that 170,000 of the lowest income seniors into a position where that annual deductible was gone. It was yeah. abolished, Mr. Speaker, where the co-payment went from $6 Per prescription down to two dollars prescription that had an incredible impact for some of the most vulnerable people in this province we will continue to advocate for pharmacare as we have i'm glad that the third party has decided to Answer. join our efforts towards this end thank you new question the member from kitchener waterloo thank you very much mr speaker peter thurley peter thurley lives in downtown kitchener I just want to remind people, in case they forgot, when I get to warnings, the next is naming, meaning you leave. Just to reinforce that. You didn't want to cooperate? I'm going to get it. Finish, please. Thank you. My question is to the Premier. Peter Thurley lives in downtown Kitchener. 
In April of 2015, Peter had a series of surgeries that saved his life because public Medicare works. But now he's paying between $700 and $1,000 out of pocket each month for medications he needs because he's, there's no public pharmacare program in Ontario. Peter has had to stop working because he still is recovering. He no longer has drug coverage. Peter's wife has some drug coverage, but it's not enough. They don't know how they will continue to pay for Peter's medication. Peter told me that every dollar his family spends on medication comes directly out of their food budget. Does the Premier think that in a province as wealthy as Ontario that this is okay? Mr. Health and Long-Term Care. Mr. Health, long -term care. Mr. Speaker, we have an excellent program in this province called Trillium, which is accessible to all Ontarians who find themselves in that very difficult, challenging situation of affordability of their medicines. And so, if those costs—and it's an income-based program, Mr. Speaker—so if those costs are exorbitant, if they're unable to afford them, that there's a place where those families, those individuals, can go. They can put in an application based on their expenditures, and there will be support for them based on their ability to pay. So I would encourage, uh, I have no doubt that the member opposite is aware of this program. It's been in existence for many years in the province. I would encourage her to work with her constituent to see if there are measures that can be done through that program and others, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the Ontario New Democrats brought in the Trillium program. Yeah. You're not listening to this story. Peter, Peter, Peter had a good job. Peter's wife has a good job, but getting sick forced them to make decisions that no Ontarian should have to make. We're used to hearing these stories coming from the United States, not from Canada. New Democrats want to fix this. Your government wants to wait for Ottawa. Can the Premier explain to Peter and his wife why they should have to wait in this province? Well, Mr. Speaker, um, so I, uh, you know, I've I appreciate the fact that uh, the NDP brought in Trillium. They also were the government that eliminated, removed 10 per cent of all the drugs that were on the formulary at the time. Almost 250 drugs, when they were government, they took off the formulary that were no longer available to Ontarians. But, Mr. Speaker, it's important that Ontarians understand the efforts that we've made. And we have had great success in part because of the Pan Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance, where we are finding across the country, and a significant portion, as you can appreciate here in Ontario, $700 million in annual savings because of the reduction in drug prices we've been able to achieve because of bulk purchasing and bulk bargaining or working out the price with the manufacturers. We've reinvested those uh those savings into new medicines and we continue to add it. We have more than 4,000 drugs on our formulary today. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, talking to Ottawa isn't going to help the 2.2 million people in this province who have no coverage. The Liberal the Liberal government in Ottawa isn't doing anything to help families in like Peter's. The Liberal government at Queen's Park isn't doing anything to help families like Peter's. Getting access to life-saving medications isn't going to get easier unless Ontario does something. The NDP is ready to act on pharmacare. Speaker, why doesn't the Premier of this province believe in universal public pharmacare? Thank you. You see that, please? You see that, please? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I am elated at the change of heart from the member from Kitchener-Waterloo because we need to remember it was only during the last election campaign in 2014 where the NDP committed to finding $600 million in savings. And when the member opposite was asked where those savings would come from, she said that they would likely. The member from Hamilton Mountain is warned. Finish, please. That their new accountability minister, their minister of cuts, would look to find efficiencies in the health care and post-secondary education. We're going to play that game. I'm going to win. The member from Kitchener-Waterloo is warned. Finish. She went on to say, quote, I would go first to health. I am elated that she's had a change of heart, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Bruce Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Education Minister. 
The minister has just announced a Liberal Party tour across rural communities to seek solutions to her government's mass school closures. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians can smell a junket when they see one, and they know this is no fact-finding mission. This is about damage control, and the Liberals looking out for their best interests, not Ontarians. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I ask, since the minister did not consult these communities before changing the rules and removing the community impact component from the school closing review process, why should they trust you now? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for this question because, you know, first of all, you know, I know that uh, there are parents who are here at the legislature today to talk about their school communities, and I want to welcome them, Mr. Speaker, because it's very important that we do listen to parents, Mr. Speaker, and, and to schools and to students, and to hear what they have to say, Mr. Speaker. And I, I also uh, want to be clear that, you know, I understand how vital schools are to local communities, Mr. Speaker. There the heart of our communities and you know every student every parent every educator cares about our students and their success mr speaker that's what we're focused on and that's why we have engaged in consultations because we want to ensure mr speaker the member of niagara west glanbrook is warned These, these engagements are important, Mr. Speaker, because we want to ensure that, you know, that we hear about the ideas and the information that parents and school communities uh, want to tell us about their local schools, Mr. Speaker. We want to continue to ensure that we provide the best education Thank possible you. for all students in Ontario. Here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Education Minister. You should be ashamed of turning the hearts out of our rural communities, because that's what you're doing. You blew the public's trust once before when you failed to consult them on new accommodation rules, resulting in possibly as many as 600 schools being closed across Ontario. Yeah. Considering the serious deficit of trust and credibility with your minister and your government, I want to know, Mr. Speaker, in the spirit of trust and collaboration, why hasn't the minister included members from this side of the House on the province-wide consultation here? Thank you. Sure. Um, you know, the member opposite um, is, is suggesting something that's simply not the case. Uh, just last week, I was in Markdale, and you were there. So, you know, there's, uh, there's, no, there's nothing that's excluding you uh, from, from coming. You know, these, these engagements, Mr. Speaker, are, are really designed so that we can ensure that we're providing the best education possible, Mr. Speaker. I've also made it very clear to our school boards, to municipalities, that we're looking for creative and innovative solutions, Mr. Speaker. We want uh, boards to work together. Um, there are really great examples of that. If you look at uh, Terrence Bay, for instance, both the English Terrace Bay, Mr. Speaker, the English and the French Catholic school boards are, are working together to share an elementary school. This is in allowing access to libraries, to gyms, to play spaces, Mr. Speaker, to technology labs, ensuring that students Answer. have the best range of programs possible. And that's what these engagements are about. How do we provide the best education for students in Ontario? New question. Member of Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is the Premier. Last year, the Minister of Energy denied that there was a crisis with soaring hydro bills. Then the government ignored the NDP's demand for a moratorium on disconnections of hydro through the winter. Only when a crisis had pushed her government into a political corner did the Premier act. Well, a new crisis is upon us. Starting May 1st, Ontario families will start losing their hydro. Does the Premier know how many families will be losing their hydro on May 1st? Of energy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very pleased to uh, rise and, and you know, talk about um, what Hydro One is doing, Mr. Speaker. Hydro One, which has millions of customers in this province, um, are extending their winter moratorium until the end of May, Mr. Oh. Speaker. That is great news, Mr. Speaker, and it just shows that Hydro One is working closely with their customers who have fallen behind on their bills, Mr. Speaker. The extra time will allow customers to take advantage of some of the early savings from 
Ontario's Fair Hydro Plan, Mr. Speaker, in which all families, small businesses, and farms in this province will get a 25 percent, up to, Mr. Speaker, on average, a 25 percent reduction. And for those families, Mr. Speaker, that in the rural or in the northern parts of our province, Mr. Speaker, that rate will be between 40 and 50 percent. They will see significant savings, Mr. Speaker, unlike nothing in their plan, Mr. Oh, Speaker. So I guess the rest don't really count, eh? They, they really aren't a factor anymore. Speaker, again to the Premier, if a family heats with natural gas, they have access to up to $1,000 in emergency relief to help pay their hydro and gas bills if they can't meet their payments. But many rural families don't have access to natural gas, and they must heat with hydro. Not only is hydro more expensive, the government only offers these struggling families $600 in emergency relief, not $1,000. Why does the Premier think it's fair that rural Ontario families paying some of the highest hydro rates in Canada don't have access to relief the way everyone else does? Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First off, when it comes to the west, the east, the north, and the south, this government is acting, Mr. Speaker. I don't know where that member is coming from with the west. But also, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to rural, when it comes to remote, and when it comes to northern, Mr. Speaker, I just said in the last supplementary, and I know he hasn't been listening to the last month and a half in terms of what our plan is doing, and I know he probably didn't pay attention during the technical briefing, but let me remind him, that's 40 to 50 percent off for rural or remote families, Mr. Speaker. And on top of that, and on top of that, Mr. Speaker, if these families qualify for the Ontario Electricity Support Program, they can get an additional 50% off of their bills as well, Mr. Speaker. So we're making sure that those in the rural and remote parts of our province are seeing significant relief Answer. on their energy bills, Mr. Speaker. We have a plan. It's already working, Mr. Speaker, by example with the OEB. It's too bad they don't have a plan that even fathoms to work. Good question. Yeah. Member from Davenport. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Energy about a concern that my constituents have raised in Davenport. Last week, the Ontario Energy Board made an announcement regarding new electricity rates to be effective on May 1st. As the independent regulator of Ontario's energy sector, the OEB is a quasi-judicial board which governs the sector with a mandate to protect ratepayers. It sets electricity rates twice a year so Ontarians know what to expect with their bills. As members of this House know well, our government has recognized that Ontarians want relief on electricity costs, and we have acted. Our plan is to lower electricity bills by an average of 25 per cent by this summer. I understand that the OEB has sure. taken early action in beginning to put these savings onto ratepayer bills. Would the minister please clarify what the impact is to all of Ontarians? Thank you. Great question. Minister Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also want to thank the member for that important question. And I was pleased, Mr. Speaker, with the OEB's decision to be begin lowering rates on, on May 1st, Mr. Speaker. No. And in anticipation uh, of our government's fair hydro plan. This is the next of uh, several steps which Ontarians will see as we work towards bills um, being reduced by 25 percent beginning this summer, Mr. Speaker, with rates held to inflation for the next four years. The OEB's decision means that bills will be reduced by 17 percent beginning May 1st. That's even earlier than expected, Mr. Speaker. The rest of our plan is intended to come into effect by this summer in order to achieve the rest of the promised savings, Mr. Speaker. The OEB would require to reduce rates again this summer when final legislation is passed to ensure Answer. Ontarians see the full benefit of our plan, Mr. Speaker, as soon as possible. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you to the minister for that response and for his hard work on this file, on a file that is so important to my constituents. Our government heard from Ontarians who were struggling with the cost of electricity, and that's why we introduced the Fair Hydro Plan. It's also why this winter we gave the OEB the power to ban power disconnections during the winter months. Several utilities actually already have this type of policy, including Hydro One. In fact, Hydro One had already implemented a ban on winter disconnections and 
introduced a winter relief program to restore power to disconnected customers as part of a broader effect to be a more customer-focused company. I understand that yesterday Hydro One made an announcement where they extended their winter moratorium to provide even more support to customers. Will the minister share with this House the details of that announcement and how it is providing further relief Question. to Ontario ratepayers? Question. Thank you, Speaker. Again, thank you to the member for the question. Yesterday, as the member mentioned, Hydro One announced they are extending their winter moratorium until the end of May. So Hydro One will be working closely with customers who have fallen behind on their bills, Mr. Speaker. And this extra time will allow customers to take advantage of some of the early savings from our Fair Hydro plan while they work with the company to make sure that they get back on the right track, Mr. Speaker. I was also pleased to see Hydro One take this step, which provides just more evidence of their new customer focus at this company. And as part of yesterday's announcement, Mr. Speaker, Hydro One is also eliminating requirements for security deposits from residential Very customers, good. as well as reducing deposit requirements for businesses, Mr. Speaker. Wow. This removes a substantial burden for many customers Answer. and will put money back in the hands of Ontarians. These actions from Hydro One work together with our government's Fair Hydro Plan, bringing fair Thank relief you. for everyone in this province. Hey. Mr. Question. Member from Carleton. Thank you very much. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. Yesterday, I once again approached the Minister to join me in Ottawa with parents and teens who are right now struggling with dangerous counterfeit drugs laced with potent and potentially fatal opioids. In my city, we are at a crisis level. Uh, earlier today, I spoke by email with our city's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Isra Levy, who agrees that this is a crisis. Last week, there were 15 recorded overdoses in a 72-hour time frame. Since last Tuesday, there have been a total of 28 recorded overdoses, all told, 13 over the weekend. These drugs are like nothing we have ever seen on our streets. The first pill can be fatal. The person taking it may only have taken the pill once. I've written and spoken to the minister and his government many times, and we need his attention on this crisis. Speaker, will the minister join me in Ottawa and meet the faces of this crisis? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, uh, thank Mr. You, Speaker. And as always, I appreciate the advocacy of the member opposite on this important issue. And uh, it is, uh, I describe it as a crisis. It's a national crisis. It's got obviously very serious provincial consequences, including in Ottawa. And I was uh, very uh, distraught when I learned of the increase in uh, overdoses uh, as a result, likely of an increased presence of, of fentanyl uh, on the streets in Ottawa. I think the member knows that this is a multifaceted approach that we have to take to this. And we are working very closely with the mayor of Ottawa, with the local municipality. Uh, we will shortly be having a, a meeting of all municipal leaders uh, that I will chair, Mr. Speaker. The Premier has uh, um, uh, uh, asserted that that meeting will take place, and uh, it, it, it uh, will allow us, I think, to work even more closely with local jurisdictions. And uh, it is uh, important that Ontarians yes, also understand that that we, in that multifaceted approach that's required, we uh, unveiled the most comprehensive uh, opioid uh, strategy that this country currently has. Mr. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Each week when I go home, I meet with Steve Cody, who lost his son to an overdose, and Sean Leary, whose daughter is struggling with addiction. Both of them are prominent businessmen who have co-founded We the Parents. They have become grassroots advocates, and they spend their spare moments meeting with hundreds of Ottawa parents and their children who have taken these counterfeit pills laced with fentanyl, some of whom have lost their own children. We have reached a crisis level, and with respect, what is being done is either not working or it is too slow reaching the people who need the help the most. Will the minister commit today to ensuring that students in our middle and high schools are part of an awareness campaign about the dangers of these new drugs? Will the minister join me in Ottawa, and will he commit to spending resources to alert the parents and their kids to this potentially life-threatening drug that are now on the streets Question. of Ottawa? The time is now to act, Minister. Minister of Health. 
Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I think it's important that the legislature and Ontarians not be left with the impression that this government isn't acting with the highest level of seriousness, including in Ottawa, Mr. Speaker, where we've committed uh, this year $1.5 million to the Dave Smith Youth Tre Treatment Centre to support the construction of a new 30-bed residential treatment facility for youth. And I have to say, Mr. Speaker, that the members, the Liberal members uh, of provincial parliament from Ottawa, particularly the member from Ottawa South, have been uh, working very closely uh, with me and with the Premier uh, addressing this issue, Mr. Speaker. And, and in Ottawa, there are more than, it's important to mention, there are more than 80 pharmacies in Ottawa alone that are providing naloxone, which is a life saving treatment for those who experience an overdose. 80 pharmacies uh, that uh, are being accessed, getting naloxone and naloxone training Answer. free of charge through their pharmacists, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. My question is for the Premier. Let me be clear, Speaker. The Premier school funding formula discriminates against small, northern, and rural schools. What does that mean for our kids? Well, in Nickel Belt, four years old children who live in Geneva Lake will be on the bus for three hours each day if they want to stay in French immersion. In the winters, kids leave home in the dark and come home from school in the dark. They are tired. Some of them hate school because of it. Their parents will struggle to convince them to stay in school. I know of little kids, Speaker, who are being bullied right now because they have to pee and cannot hold it for one and a half hour in a bus. Wow. Premier, do you believe that it is acceptable for northern and rural children to grow up without a community school? Please. Thank you. Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, our priority is to ensure that every student in Ontario receives the best education possible, Mr. Speaker. And we recognize the distinct challenges that are facing rural and northern school boards, Mr. Speaker. And that is why we are giving more resources to rural and northern boards than ever before. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the school boards are projected um, overall to receive $23.8 billion in the 2017-18 school year through the Grants for Students' Needs. And this is an increase of $849 billion million from last year. Every board across this province will receive an increase in funding. Rural boards are projected to receive $3.8 billion in the 2017-18 GSN, and that's an increase of $1.3 million, or a 3.7% increase, Mr. Speaker, from last year. So we want to ensure that our rural boards have the resources that they need, and that is Thank exactly you. what we're doing. Thank you, Speaker. Our children suffer because of this Liberal government school funding formula, and so do our communities. After the school in Norton closed, the first thing to go was the ice cream shop, then the chip stand, then the one and only store, and now even the one and only gas station is gone. Hmm. Donya Chenin moved to Levac so that her six-year-old son could attend French immersion at Levac Public School. She's now worried that Levac will be the next ghost town if this Liberal government continues with the spree of school closure. Yet, when the Premier when her minister hear the fears of families in Lavac, they ignore them and just keep right on at it with an unfair funding formula. This government still has 300 schools on the chopping block. What do they have to say to the worried family in Lavac? Thank you. You know, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I want. I want. It's important that, uh, that that everyone recognizes that the funding formula recognizes the unique needs of our rural and northern boards, and that's why there is $1,200 per student more to rural and northern schools than to urban schools, Mr. Speaker. I want to wow. make that very clear. And news. you know, I have visited schools in uh, in northern Ontario, yes, Mr. Have. Speaker. I, I visited schools in Sioux Lookout, and wow. you know, I want to talk about some of the innovative things that our school boards are doing on behalf of our students. And 
And uh, when you look at the Kuwait and Patricia District School Board, Mr. Speaker, they're opening a new secondary school in partnership wow. with Confederation College, with uh, Menoya Health Centre, and Firefly Mental Health. Because of the unique needs in that community, Mr. Speaker, they are working together to design this unique hub to meet the needs of the students who are in that community, Mr. Speaker, so that they have Answer. the support that they need, Mr. Speaker. And we are we are supporting the the board in that decision as they move forward. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. The green investments that are outlined in our Climate Change Action Plan are now starting to roll out, and we are seeing the tangible benefits of these investments. In my own riding of Kitchener Centre, home energy audits are saving many homeowners a lot of money. Now, just over a year ago, Speaker Mary Jane Patterson, she heads Reap Green Solutions. This is a nonprofit group that promotes energy efficiency in KW. She came to see me to lobby in favour of home energy audits and retrofits. And a few days later, we delivered on that in our budget. Speaker, in my community, home energy evaluations have doubled. This clearly shows that homeowners and businesses are actively engaged in our climate action plan. Speaker, Ontarians know that these investments are lowering their carbon footprint and it's lowering their energy costs. So Question. could the minister please explain to the House the long-term value of these investments? Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I know it probably won't come to as a surprise to many people here that the part of Ontario we know as KW Awesome is out ahead of much of the province on this. The REAP program is truly one of the most innovative on doing education and demonstrating technology. The program and expansion based on that experience and the members' advocacy is going to lead to 1.6 a million tons of GHG reductions, one of the largest, Mr. Speaker, and the audits that the Premier, this was actually the Premier's idea, to get these audits out so people could learn and understand the technologies, the savings, and the development. We're doing 37,000 of them that will, in the end, not only reduce GHGs, but significantly bring down people's heating and, and energy bills, Mr. Speaker. So, no pun intended for the Premier, this is a win-win-win scenario, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer and for his leadership on this important initiative. And He has a lot of fans and supporters in Kitchener-Waterloo. It is very encouraging to hear that Ontarians are seeing the benefits of green investments and that they're taking an active role in fighting climate change. Not only is this helping us to achieve our emission reduction targets, but it's also helping us to create jobs. Now, to date, we have produced over 40,000 jobs tied to green energy. Energy. And here's another interesting stat, Speaker. According to reports released by Environmental Defence, Blue Green Canada, and the Clean Economy Alliance, green investments can produce up to 32,900 green jobs in the province. And their research also found an additional 24,000 jobs could be created from the reinvestments of the green cost savings. Speaker, could the minister please explain why making these investments are important to Thank creating you. jobs? Sir. Mr. Speaker, and it gives me great pleasure just to talk about the economic dimensions. And you're quite right, environmental defense. And actually, a parallel study done by Pembina Institute showed that the first, just the first tranche of investments of $2.5 billion creates 33,000 high-skilled jobs in Ontario. By the time, by the time, Mr. Speaker. We have retrofitted all of the buildings in Ontario, which this program will do over the next couple of decades. It will probably be the biggest single job creation program in Ontario. Wow. And Mr. Speaker, but while we have the win on our side, we are very worried about a brownout from the other side, Mr. Speaker. A complete brownout of all of the funding programs. When the, because the member opposite would tear up the cap and trade system. These jobs or savings would never appear, Mr. Speaker. We know Ontarians want to win. They don't want to brown out, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. People in northwestern Ontario have a life expectancy 2.9 years shorter than the rest of the province. 
Speaker, a report from Health Quality Ontario has confirmed the reality facing Northern Ontarians. They are more likely to have cardiovascular disease, have limited access to healthy foods, be obese, and they are more likely to commit suicide. Northerners navigate a health care system with reduced access to testing and to doctors. The Ministry's own Rural and Northern Health Care Report identified these issues in 2011. Speaker, when is the minister going to address the regional disparities in our health care system? Here, here. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, this is a, a very important issue, and I appreciated the report that came out from Health Quality Ontario that pointed to uh, the work that needs to be done to address the. Uh, as they themselves indicated, a lot of this has to do with the social determinants of health, but to address the fact that uh, individuals in the north uh, do have challenges uh, in the north because of residing there, because of the nature of, uh, of uh, the situation uh, that are different than in the south. But, Mr. Speaker, we are making enormous investments in the north as we are throughout the province. Since coming into office, we've increased the funding in northern hospitals by 55 per cent. We just announced recently in Thunder Bay, a new cardiac centre which will provide both vascular surgery as well as cardiac surgery. And I want to thank uh, both members uh, from uh, Thunder Bay, the, uh, both MPPs who worked uh, hard to be able to make that yes, reality, sir. and I'm happy to speak more in the supplementary. Great. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, to the Minister, well, Speaker, research published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal about cardiovascular events shows that the three healthiest, healthiest limbs are in the GTA. Hmm. On the other hand, the three, three of the four least healthy limbs are the Northeast, Northwest, and North Simcoe, Muskoka. Shame. It is deplorable that today where you live in Ontario is a determinant of your health and your life expectancy. Speaker, I'm going to the Northern, Northwestern Ontario Municipal Association Conference later this week. What does the minister have to say to the people in the Northwest, Lynn? Thank you. Minister? Well, that we continue to invest in the North, Mr. Speaker. The first nurse practitioner-led clinic was in the North in Sudbury. We have uh, 42 family health teams in the North as well. And I, I know if the, if the member opposite read the CMAJ report, it, I think it was likely the one that referenced the Health Quality Ontario report, which was the report that we commissioned through an agency of government to actually provide us with that additional valuable information. And they pointed to areas where we could continue to improve and where investments uh, should be made. We've made uh, over $157 million of investments in additional surgeries and bringing down wait times in the northern region as well. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there's a lot of work to do across the province. I'm very fixed at the north as well because of the unique challenges faced there and what we can do more to improve the health situation uh, of our northern residents. Yes, sir. Speaker. Thank you. No question. The member from Timmins, James Bay. My uh, question is to the Premier. Premier, we've all heard the latest attack on Ontario's forest industry. The Trump administration is slapping a 20 per cent tariff on softwood lumber, claiming the Ontario industry is subsidized. Premier, we all know that's not the case. In fact, in 2015, decision by the trade tribunals found that Ontario does not, I repeat, does not subsidize its forest industry. So what the U.S. couldn't get done through the front door in 2015, Trump is trying to get through the back door, and would appear his strategy is meant to tie up our forest producers and a lengthy, costly fight, which I'm confident we will win in the end. However, this time, many producers may not be able to withstand this latest frivolous attack by Mr. Trump. So, Premier, what are you prepared to do in order to help our producers survive as we fight back this frivolous attempt to hurt our industry? Thank you, Premier. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I, uh, I thank the member for the question. It's certainly on everybody's mind today about our our, uh, our uh, softwood sector. Certainly, I want to reassure everybody in the House that Ontario is standing shoulder to shoulder with our forestry industry in order to protect their workers at this time of economic uncertainty. Certainly, we cannot let the uh, unpredictability of our southern neighbour affect the jobs and well-being of Ontario. So, I want to reassure everybody that Ontario has been uh, looking uh, to things that we can do in the meantime. We've been aware that uh, 
This has been coming for some time. We also uh, know that the 20 per cent tariffs on our lumber are unfair, and uh, we are going to be uh, stepping forward with a number of things. We have been working uh, very closely with our federal partners. Answer. We have uh, called on our federal government to uh, provide a loan guarantee program to help in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, according, listen, you've come pretty late to the game. We've known that this has been coming for some time. You just now start to react. We've already heard from BC. We've already heard from Quebec. And your response is, is to say, well, we're going to depend on Ottawa to be able to fix this problem for us. This industry in Ontario is unique and specific to our problem. Stop the clock. My resolve has not changed from, the, from earlier. That's not helpful either. Please put your question. As I said, the industry in Ontario is pretty specific to Ontario. We have a system that is probably the best in the world. It is not subsidized. We have a competitive tariff system based on price, and we should be taking a position, Ontario, to make sure that we do what's right for this province. And if that means we do what Quebec did and provide our own loan guarantee program, so be it. So can you assure us and assure the 57,000 people that work in this industry, we're not going to diddle as we watch Ottawa do nothing? Okay. You it, please. You it, please. Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker. And again, I want to say that this is a federal issue, and it's up to our, our federal partnership to negotiate this. In saying that, we have come forward on uh, new initiatives. For instance, we're providing $10 million in new, fund in new funding to the forestry industry to reimburse costs for road construction and maintenance on public access road. We have announced uh, just today that we have $74 million from this government to assist with the forest access road program that helps to have public access and that connecting some of our northern remote communities. We hired a, a, a chief negotiator, the forder, former federal trade minister, Jim Peterson, who is on board to help to negotiate this deal. We've been meeting with our industry partners. They have asked for these things. Answer. We are going to be uh, continuing to work with our federal partnership to uh, ask for that federal loan guarantee. Thank program. you. Thank you. Question the member from Trinity Spadina. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Speaker, our government is a proud supporter of Ontario's uh, culture sector because of the great work being done by our artists, musicians, writers, teachers, curators. Culture is one of Ontario's fastest growing sectors. In my riding of Trinity Spadina and across Ontario, our government's support for culture continues to bring people together, build Ontario's identity, and create jobs and grow our economy. I'm pleased to ask the minister about an announcement she made recently at Ryerson Image Centre. The minister announced this year's spring and summer recipient of Ontario Culture Attraction Fund, which is a fund designed to increase culture tourism, support events that foster economic growth and contribute to job creation. Speaker, through you to the minister. Can she tell the member of this House more Question. about the OCAF fund and how it will impact arts organizations across our province? Thank you, Minister of Tourism, Culture, Sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the uh, member from Trinity Spadina for his question and for his steadfast support of the vibrant arts and culture organizations in his riding. As the member mentioned, I was at Ryerson Image Centre last month to announce support for festivals such as the Scotiabank Contact Photography, which will kick off at the Image Centre on Friday. While there, I announced that this spring and summer season, 45 arts and culture organizations will receive over $2.8 million in support through the Ontario Cultural Attractions Fund. These include, and they're across our, our province speaker, Franco Fett in Ottawa, A Taste of Greece in London, the Eight Day Stars and Thunder International Fireworks and Music Festival in Timmins. This year's recipients include events that will commemorate Ontario's 150th anniversary and speaker. Our support helps communities and organizations to attract uh, business through tourism and economic development. I look forward to adding more in the Thank supplementary. You. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the Minister for her response. Many festivals and events, like the Hot Dog Film Festival in my riding, which begins tomorrow, tomorrow night, is the world's largest, largest documentary film festival. 
They are having a positive impact on tourism and culture scene in Ontario. Our government continues to work closely with our partners to build a stronger culture sector. Last year, the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport introduced Ontario's first culture strategy. The four, the four goals of the culture strategy are promoting culture engagement and inclusion, strengthening culture in communities, and fueling the creative economy, and promoting the value of arts throughout the government. The culture strategy envisions an Ontario where every person has an opportunity to creative expression and culture partition, uh, participation, and where the diversity of our stories and community is reflected, valued, and celebrated. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, Question. can she tell this House on the economic impact and how our support for culture impacts Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Oh, look at that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member for his question. You know, Speaker, we're very proud of the Hot Dogs Festival. It's something as a government we're enormously proud of. They have a global reach and a global impact, and we're absolutely really thrilled to see them because they're doing amazing work. And we understand as a government, Speaker, that arts and artists play an important role, not just in bringing joy into our lives, Speaker, but they contribute very much to our economy as well. And it's why we're, we're proud of our education system, because when I hear from organizations from around the world why they're investing in Ontario, they speak speak loudly and clearly about the quality of our graduates and our education and our school system speaker. But culture is really not just about joy, which is also important. It's about jobs, speaker, to the tune of $25 billion to our economy and over 280,000 jobs. These are critically important to the vitality of not just our arts and culture sector, but to our economy. And we're enormously Sir? proud of our arts and our artists for the world and global recognition that they're getting. Thank you, yeah. Thank you very much. New question. Member from Thorn Hill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Child and Youth Services. A report came out yesterday that details horrific outcomes for youth who exit the foster care system. Typically, their lives involve low academic achievement, unemployment, underemployment and poverty, Sad. homelessness and housing insecurity, criminal justice system involvement, early parenthood, poor physical and mental health, and of course, loneliness. If the child welfare system was a parent, it may well have its kids taken away. Mr. Speaker, will the minister tell us what he is doing to ensure that Ontario's most vulnerable youth have the same future as that which we plan for our own children? Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member uh, for the question. Um, as the member knows, over the last uh, several months, uh, we've been working on a new act here in the province of Ontario to uh, better protect uh, children, youth and families here in our province. Uh, in fact, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, recently um, a report came out uh, called One Vision, One Voice, which looks at black youth here in the province of Ontario, uh, specifically in Toronto, where there's a huge overrepresentation of black youth uh, in our um, child protection system. And Mr. Speaker, um, to go even beyond that, um, within that report, there was a call to collect uh, good data. The Anti-Racism Directorate is working to, uh, to look at how race, um, when we talk about black and indigenous youth who are overly represented. In fact, Mr. Speaker, in Toronto, it's over 50 percent if you combine the indigenous and the black youth Answer. together. So we're working uh, with um, advocates. Uh, with, within the child care system to look for ways to better position Thank young you. people for success here in Ontario. Thank you. The minister is legally the parent of approximately 1,000 youth who age out of the system every year in Ontario. Their life outcomes are horrific and compromise the talented people who could be thriving in our society. Mr. Speaker, we must have higher expectations for the child welfare system that parents these youth in their most formative years. After all, the new legislation pays a lot of attention to accountability, but there's a big miss. What's missing are checks and balances to determine if our system is an effective parent. Presently, no one is systemically studying the outcomes for youth aging out of Ontario. So, Speaker, if the minister does not measure youth outcomes after care in any way, how does he know if anything he has been implementing is actually working? Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, 
You know, I don't like I don't want to politicize this issue, but when it caught when, when we talk about a big miss here in the legislature, not once has anyone from that side of the house asked me about the overrepresentation of indigenous or black children in the child welfare system. So I think I think that's a big miss here in the province of Ontario, and especially in this legislature. Mr. Speaker, we've set up the anti-racism directorate. We're looking at um, uh, reform of the act within uh, child welfare. We are looking for ways to better position young people. For success, and in fact, Mr. Speaker, those young people—you know—we refer to them sometimes as, as neat youth. You know, they're not employed uh, in education or some type of training. There's 173,000 of them. We have a, a strategy here in the province of Ontario to look for ways to to provide more opportunities. And the very fact that this is a government for the first time that look at 16 and 17-year-olds and how to bring them into protection—I think this government should be very proud of the work that it's doing. Thank you. Please. We have a deferred vote on the motion to second reading of Bill 114, an act to provide anti-racism measures. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
All members, please take your seats. <laughs> I can't. There it is. I want a picture. All members, please take your seats. Your own seats. On April 6, 2017, Mr. Coteau moved second reading of Bill 114, an act to provide anti-racism measures. All those in favour, please arise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Mackey. Mr. Mackey. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Mangas. Mrs. Mangas. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Domerlin. Mr. Domerlin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Jassic. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mrs. Wong. Mrs. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Mrs. Hogarth. Mrs. Hogarth. Mrs. Koala. Mrs. Koala. Mrs. Molly. Mrs. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Ronaldo. Mr. Ronaldo. Mr. Vernil. Mr. Vernil. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong. Madame Gelina. Madame Gelina. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. Ms. Pauls, please rise one at a time. You're recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 85, the nays are zero. The ayes being 85, the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, deuxième lecture du projet de loi. Shall the bill be ordered for third reading? Minister of the Children and Youth Services. General Government. So, member from Member from Mrs. Arendale on a point of order. Mr. Speaker. Uh, we are celebrating the Basaki function and doing prayer in the legislature today, so I wanted to take this opportunity to invite all members of the legislature and the guests to join us in room number 247 from now till 1.30. Everyone is welcome. Thank you. Member from Brampton Springdale. Thank Point you, Mr. Order. Speaker. My aunt and uncle were here visiting me from India, and they were in the gallery a little bit earlier today, so I did want to take an opportunity to introduce them, Mr. Surjit, Mrs. Surjit Gill and Mr. Jaginder Gill. Thank you. Thank you. The Minister of Community Safety on a point of order. On a point of order, Mr. Speaker, I would like to welcome uh, to the Legislative Assembly the Ontario Association of Police Services Board to Queen's Park today and welcome everyone in the House for their reception in room 247 at 5 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. There being no further deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.